Hello and welcome to the Diverse Bookshelf with me, Samia Aziz. On this show, I interview incredible authors doing a deep dive into important themes and issues while talking all things books. This week on the podcast, I'm welcoming back my friend, the incredibly insightful and thoughtful Dr. Sophia Rahman. Sophia now has a second book out in the world called Gendering the Hadith, Recentering the Authority of Aisha, Mother of the Believers, which is her PhD thesis now published as a book. On the show this week, we dig into understanding translation and interpretation, getting to know Aisha that bit better, and talking about what we can learn from her and from the Prophet, peace be upon him, about justice, hope, resilience. Dr. Safiya Rahman is an independent scholar specializing in Islam and gender. She works as a knowledge building consultant for Musaba Movement, a global organization committed to the reform of Muslim family law in line with gender egalitarian readings of Islam. As a PhD candidate, she was a PG Impact Fellow at the Centre of Religion and Public Life and PRHS Scholar. She is the founder of the Islam and Gender Readalongs, in which she facilitates readings of academic texts penned by Muslim scholars in conversation with a global virtual audience, and has recently been featured by Vogue Arabia, Refinery29 and The Independent. She's the author of A Treasury of Aisha bint Abu Bakr and Gendering the Hadith, Recentering the Authority of Aisha, Mother of the Believers. She's a contributor to Mapping Faith, Theologies of Migration, edited by Leah Shimada, Cut from the Same Cloth, edited by Sabina Akhtar, Violent Phenomena, 21 Essays on Translation, and Gathering, Women of Colour on Nature, published by 404 Inc. You can connect with her on Instagram, Sophia underscore reading, where she talks about all things related to books, faith and academia. Before we get on with today's episode with Sophia, I'm just going to take a moment to tell you about the sponsors of today's episode. Now, I know when it comes to giving charity, it can feel a little overwhelming. There are so many charities to choose from, all seemingly doing amazing work. So who can you trust? For this episode, I've teamed up with Muslim Charity, a UK-based international charity inspired by Islamic values, who've been serving and uplifting needy and vulnerable communities since 1999. Muslim Charity are focused on empowerment and creating opportunities for those in need, giving them the skills and resources to thrive, create livelihoods, tackle hunger and thirst, and break cycles of poverty honesty and transparency, reaching some of the world's most impoverished and remote locations. They provide food, water, orphan care, education, healthcare and so much more. They are swift and thorough during emergencies and disasters and they stay around long after rebuilding communities. If you're looking for a charity you can trust, especially when it comes to your zakat and sadaqa, Muslim charity is the one for you. Visit muslimcharity.org.uk forward slash Samia to check out some of my favourite impactful projects. Assalamu alaikum, Sophia. Welcome. Welcome back to the Diverse Bookshelf podcast. How, well, how are you doing? Well, Samia. Thank you for having me back. I'm so excited to be back. I loved our conversation the first time around. So I'm looking forward to speaking again with you. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Last 10 days of Ramadan. So just soaking that up. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm thrilled to have you back on the show. I loved speaking to you last year about your book, which was A Treasury of Aisha, which is obviously still available for everyone. And I hope that people have been picking up again this Ramadan. But very excitingly, you've had or you're having your PhD thesis published as well. And again, this is obviously also about Aisha Radiyala Anha and look into... The, it's well it's called the gendering of hadith so let's start let's start at the beginning so obviously clearly you are very interested in the life of Aisha radiallahu anha where did that begin for you and what do you really seek to do through yeah, your work thank you for that yeah so the title of the thesis as a book in its published form is gendering the hadith tradition recentering the authority of Aisha mother of the believers 
And yeah, you're right. Of course, I have immense love and admiration and interest in Aisha. And I, I think it's really hard, actually, to be able to identify a single moment when my interest in Aisha radiallahu anha is, is sparked. I think when I look back on where did it begin, I think actually, firstly, I have to give thanks to my mum and the stories of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions, which she raised my brother and I on. Uh, and Aisha, along with others, felt like a little like the extended family we had who all lived abroad. People my mother loved deeply, her mother and her siblings and, and then their children, people that we didn't really meet that often because my mum loved them and spoke about them in such loving ways and she shared their stories. It was a similar kind of connection that we had with the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions is through their stories that my mum would relay to us that my brother and I also developed a, a deep love for them. Then as I got older and started to take some more active interest in Islam, I think there's a point in our lives, each of us who are born into Muslim families where we take ownership of our belief and we take ownership of how we understand our faith and our connection to Allah. It's not something that we just simply inherit, but it's something that we start to uh, engage ourselves. And so there was a point in sort of my teens where I started to explore Islam for myself. And it was impossible to miss Aisha. She popped up time and again as this key protagonist in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, in the narration of his traditions. But really, honestly, Samia, it wasn't until I spent three years doing my PhD, spending so much time researching Aisha, her words, her life, her history, her stories, that I came to have a true appreciation of just who Aisha was and, and really continues to be, which is to say that she was this astute and intelligent woman. And she was affirmed by many as the first scholar of Islam. She was an authoritative figure whose words continue to hold incredible power. And she was politically engaged. She'd been an unofficial advisor to both the first caliph of Islam, her father Abu Bakr, and the second caliph of Islam, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma. So she was this, and, and of course we know that she was also uh, a comfort to the Prophet ﷺ himself, that the Prophet sought her out in, in his last uh, days uh, and, and chose to, to pass away in her arms. She was um, an ardent upholder of the truth of, of justice. She engaged politically and even militarily when this is what she felt was necessary to uh, achieve justice and truth. And so she continues to be recognized uh, as a jurist, as a fiqiha, uh, and as really the highest authority on the prophetic tradition. And we know that she is one about whom verses of the Quran were revealed to exonerate her from the slander that was spread about her regarding her fidelity as a young woman. Uh, and she was, of course, the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. We owe it to her to get to know her, to study her life and take lessons from it. And I think what I've realized over the last few years, and especially when I, if I do an event on, on either of my books, or if, or if somebody has read uh, a book of mine and comes back to me, whether that's A Treasury of Aisha, or whether it's my new book, Gendering the Hadith Tradition, or if they've listened to a podcast or come to an event, yeah, I'll always have people come and say, I never thought of Aisha like this before, or I never knew these stories about Aisha before, or I never was presented these lessons on the stories of Aisha's life before. And I and for me, it's so exciting to see people start to go down this path of getting to know Aisha radiallahu anha that much better than they did before. Because she is phenomenal. She is an absolutely phenomenal woman whose life is packed full of inspiring, not only stories of what she achieved, but actually unlocking possibilities of what it means for us to be Muslim women and what we can achieve as well. I think what you said is like so powerful. I love what you said at the beginning in terms of like how you grew up with hearing about stories about Aisha and the other companions. And I think that's so beautiful because 
I guess there's almost like a worry that when we're teaching children about Islam and we're teaching them about Islamic history, it's something that feels so disconnected. It's something that gets like compartmentalized and something that that is so distant. But really, and I think we do a, a disservice to our to ourselves to not like almost submerge ourselves into that life and into those stories and really take them on and consider these people our companions and our guides and sisters and mothers and fathers and brothers because uh, we are and we describe ourselves as, as siblings and I think to really try and embody that and take that on I think is really something that we should all be aiming for and I'm not surprised because I, I think like before reading your book especially like I, I didn't know nearly as much about Aisha Lillian has a do now thanks uh, to you and the work of other people also and I think generally in in like translation and the way that stories are retold, it's often that women are sidelined or they become like a footnote in history. And that's such a shame because sometimes it's a really pivotal moment that just ends up as a footnote or is misinterpreted. And so obviously the language of the Quran and the records of Hadith are all from Arabic. And so what a lot of us look for our translations in English or another language so that we can understand it. But what do you think are some of the things, especially when it comes to Hadith and the life of Aisha radiallahu like what are some of the things that have gotten lost with translation? Yeah, so when I was writing my thesis for gendering the Hadith, one of my supervisors suggested I would need to explain my translation methodology. And famous last words, she said to me, oh, it needn't be more than a paragraph. And that that (laughs) proved to be so wildly inaccurate. When I sat down to write about how I was translating, what my considerations were and what was the process of translation, especially with regards to the Hadith tradition, that single paragraph grew into not only an entire chapter within my book, but it actually spawned two other chapters in two other books. So the first was, the first essay was titled Translation and Recentering of Aisha in the Hadith Canon. And that was published in Mapping, Mapping Faith, Theologies of Migration and Community. And in that chapter, I looked at the similarity and limitations and opportunities in the movement of words from one language to another in translation and the movement of human beings from home to another geographical location. I saw lots of parallels between the experience Mm. of human beings migrating from one place that they consider home to another place which they consider foreign, but wherein they are also perceived as foreign and how that really, there's an imitation between that in translation, (laughs) when we take words from sort of their source texts and their original contexts and translate them, seek to translate them into other languages. And what do we translate and what do we not translate? What is translated and what resists translation? So that was the first chapter. And then there was another one that I wrote for Violent Phenomena, And in that one, I looked at the decolonizing of translation. For me, there are three issues that I contended with when engaging with translation work. And the first was the historicity and situationality. So my source texts, the text that I'm translating from, is a classical text. And I mainly worked with a 14th century text. But this 14th century text heavily relied upon is, sorry, heavily relied upon by Muslims around the globe to inform their religious praxis in the contemporary world they inhabit. So we're in the 21st century. But I want to remain loyal to the intention of the 14th century authors, who in turn were quoting 7th century first generation Muslims. And I have to do this all in a way that is also relevant to the 21st century believer without undermining the historical context of the 14th century. So the historicity and situationality of my text is something that I need to consider when I'm translating. And the second issue is that Mm. of gender, which is is not going to be of any surprise to those Mm. who know my work. So translating a text that is Arabic and Mm. therefore gendered It's a gendered language. Everything has a gender from human beings to animals to inanimate objects. 
how then do I translate such a heavily gendered text or rather language into a non-gendered language like English? This means being sensitive to gendered readings of the Islamic tradition. And this is particularly so with regards to readings or expressions that are inherently gendered in a manner that could be construed as lending religious legitimacy to sexist translations of the text and and mm. unwittingly allowing misogynistic inter- interpretations of Islam itself to come in via the translation process. And then the third issue is that of, again, no surprise, Orientalism. Islam, as we know so well, your podcast is a great example. You you really look at literature in a way that seeks to decolonize how we read our texts and what texts we're reading, texts that counter Orientalist representations, reductive representations of Muslims and, and others, <laughs> others with the capital O. And we know that Islam has been systematically othered by a variety of mediums. We know it's been othered through the media, through arts, through education systems, academia, political discourse, and the list goes on. It's been declared so deeply and utterly antithetical to the West that a clash of civilizations is almost like a foregone conclusion in the imaginary of just far too many people. Despite the record of history, which attests to how much the so-called West owes to Muslim scientists, philosophers, artists, and yes, even religious scholars. So my challenge then becomes one of maintaining the distinction between the different languages. So where on the one hand, I'm thinking, okay, how do I make everything relevant that I'm translating to the 21st century audience, where I'm also thinking about not, not gendering in a way that brings in misogyny and misogynistic interpretations of Islam and where I want to reduce the distance between today's reader and the 14th century or 7th century um, source of what I'm writing. At the same time, I also know that I do need to maintain certain distinctions between the different languages, traditions and cultures and times but to do so in a way that doesn't contribute to the othering of Arabs and or, or Muslims. So it's a lot that, you're, that I was contending with that I think about when I'm translating, and I hadn't actually consciously thought of that until I had to consider and present what my translation methodology would be. So with all of this in mind, plus just the beautiful layered complexities of the Arabic language, I had to devise a methodology for translation of the Hadith for my own thesis, and I added to that actually the need to know Aisha radiallahu anha because so often her statements have been presented in a particular way. But when we get to know her character and history, her own way of practicing and embodying Islam and the context of her statements, so that situationality, that historicity that I talked about, we can often read those very same statements entirely differently. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. So there's a Excuse me, there's a hadith that's recorded by Imam al So I should note at this point that my thesis was based on a 14th century text by Imam al And in this text, he records over 200 statements of Aisha's where she is correcting or refuting or corroborating the statements of primarily male companions. And in this text, Imam al records that Aisha was informed that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri anhu, had said that the messenger of Allah forbids a woman from traveling unless she is accompanied by a mahram, a male relative. And Amra said, Aisha then turned to the women folk and said, not all of you has a mahram. Now, there are some scholars, and even as Zarqishi argues, that Aisha's repetition of Al-Khudri's statement was an affirmation of what he was saying, that she was approving of what Al-Khudri was saying. But actually, when we study the life of Aisha, when we look at you know, a larger body of her responses and, and how she managed traditions that were being ascribed to her husband, we actually see a pattern emerge and we see this mode of teaching in Aisha very often where something she takes exception to is mentioned in her presence. What she does is she will ask questions to probe the fallacy of what is being said. And there are other examples that I can give to you on this very quickly. So, for example, somebody else mentions to her that somebody had stated that 
if you do the ghusl, so you wash the body of, of somebody who's died, that you have to do ghusl yourself. And rather than arguing against that, she said, she says, and so what of the people who carry the body? You know, so she extends it. And, and what she's doing by asking that question is trying to critically engage the minds of the, the Muslims in her audience, in her surrounding, to come to the correct conclusion themselves, because she recognizes that she's not going to be there forever. A good teacher is one that equips their students with the right tools to be able to continue without them. So that's what she did when that was presented to her. And essentially, she says that the Muslim is not impure and doesn't become a source of impurity for other Muslims. So she was again essentially uh, refuting the original comment. Uh, and there's another instance, for example, with regards to unbraiding the hair. Someone says, so-and-so has said that you have to unbraid your hair to do ghusl. And she and her response is, why didn't he just order us all to shave our heads? I love, I just love her sass as well. Again, exposing the problem by presenting this, the, the fallacy of the logic behind the statement. And so, like I said, because she was an excellent teacher, she didn't just dish out answers. She encouraged her students to think critically. And, and I use the word students broadly. They're not students in the sort of, in the formal sense that we think of in terms of schooling. Everyone in her presence who was a willing student, they were all there to learn from her. And so she's encouraging them all to think critically, to engage their minds and their hearts and to ponder rather than to just passively accept. So I love this way of responding by her about the, the encouragement that she gives to her students to think critically, to engage their minds and hearts. Instead of engaging the one who's relayed the statement or entering into a polemic about the rights and wrongs of that assertion, she, she turns to her audience. She, she turns to the very women who will be affected by this statement in provocation. And this is a, a pedagogical approach that we see Aisha enact numerous times. She puts the problem to those who will be worst hit to rise up, to not just accept difficulties as par for the course of being a good Muslim woman, you know, instead to speak mm. up and to say no to authority when it's behaving unjustly. <coughs> and not only is this more mm. likely because we see this as a repeated pattern in her, but also she is then known to have traveled without a male guardian. She's known to have traveled without a mahram, even as they were available to her and she makes no apologies for it. So yes, there is the technical aspect of translation that occupies itself with linguistics. But for me, there's also this human aspect, the knowing of my subject and their history and bringing that to bear on the translation. So as to make it not only linguistically accurate, but also historically accurate and authentic to Aisha's personality. So yeah, translation is it's such a fascinating area and for me being true not only to these words on paper which of course is really important but also to be really true to who Aisha was as an individual as well yeah it's so interesting because of it like you said like translation isn't that that act or the art of translation isn't just about finding the mm -hmm. right word for a word in another language it's not just about saying, okay, this is the Arabic word and this is exactly what it means in English. It is about understanding the, what was going on, the person that is being written about, how it's going to be received in this society, in this world, and this in this time. And just when you were talking, like I was thinking about how sometimes there's Shakespeare and sometimes they feel so off because what I feel has happened is like the soul of the characters that Shakespeare was writing, so said Macbeth. When we've got a modern day retelling, and it's like 2023, and it's like in America, fine, it's 2023 and it's America, but it doesn't feel like the same character. And I guess that is what you want to avoid because you're not, you don't want to change what has been written. It's about tra translating it. It's about understanding it unpicking it and then retelling it in a way that 
in a language that makes sense, in a time that makes sense, in a way that's going to be received. It's very multi, like it's very multi-layered. And I think particularly interested in the element of gender, which is obviously what you're really interested in as well. And one of the things, this is slightly off topic, but one of the things that comes up repeatedly is the the so-called law. And <clears throat> the, most commonly, Allah is referred to as he, in the English language anyway, as he. And what, I'm, what I've seen more is an understanding that like that just isn't sufficient, like it's not encompassing of what Allah really is, because we have like binary ideas about gender, and so it doesn't really work. But it really s- sits with people, it makes people very uneasy to, th- to think about gender when it comes to faith and spirituality. And I wondered what your experience of that was and how you deal with some of these issues when it comes to just how uncomfortable people feel about thinking about gender and the gendering of how we talk about religion or how we talk about God. Wow, there's a lot there, Samia. So I just wanted to quickly go back to the analogy or the, the expression that you made of uh, Shakespeare and and how that can feel so inauthentic sometimes when they try to rejig it to the 21st century. And and I can appreciate that. I I think when we're talking about, you have a lot of liberty with something that's fictional in the first place. So with something like Shakespeare, and you can be playful and it can be quite interesting and creative. And and there's some really great stuff that's been produced in the retellings of Shakespeare and other works as well. When you're working with a traditional religious text, an authoritative text like the Quran or the Hadith, obviously you don't have that same type of license to be completely creative in whatever way you want to go. That's absolutely not available to you. But what we do have is, I think as a translator, you have to be humble enough to know that translation is also subjective. If anybody tells you that their translation is not subjective, that's a liar. <laughs> that's either someone that's lying or is deluded because we bring <laughs> ourselves into the translation process. There's no way of not bringing in our lived experiences or our uh, context into anything that we do. And the idea that you could ever create anything with absolute objectivity is actually one of the fallacies of white supremacist academia. This is why they thought they could go into our countries that they were going to colonize and study the natives and come up. And it it reeks. Now we look at Orientalist works and actually it's not works of long forgotten histories. It, it continues. Pick up a newspaper today and look at how they write about folk in Gaza right now, it reeks of this white supremacist agenda, which is so arrogant in its belief that it resides outside of any lived experience or that it can park its lived experience at the door and write a completely neutral piece. It's just impossible to do. And Mm -hmm. translation is just exactly the same. I hope and I wish that I have worked on, on, on a particular text. I've worked on Al-Ijaba, the 14th century text of Imam Zarkishi. I have done a partial translation of it that is in my um, latest book, Gendering the Hadith Tradition. I hope to do a full translation of that text. I hope that in 20, 30, 40 years from now, somebody else will pick up that very same text and translate it again. And that it will be better than how I Mm. have translated it. This is why we have multiple translations of the Quran. This is why we prefer some translations over others. It's why we continue to have multiple translations of the Hadith as well. And other texts that our scholars have written for us. Because we recognize that actually when we go to these texts, we're making demands of them. And our demands today are different to the demands of Muslims of before. And our demands will continue to evolve. And so therefore, how we translate texts, what we translate, this will also alter as we go along. So whilst we don't have that creative license to go completely wild with the text, those that I occupy myself with, in the way that someone could with Shakespeare. And of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of resentment, even you, you have your puritanicals in, in English literature as well gasped at that kind of thing (laughs) or retellings of greek mythology people go wild Mm. you you present i mean i'll give you a really silly but very 
you know, relevant example is when they cast The Little Mermaid as black as a black act with a black actress and people went mad and it was like, but The Little Mermaid is white. And mm. it was like, The Little Mermaid doesn't exist. But <laughs> what happens is when you have these slight shifts in retellings or new translations or different approaches to translations, what it actually does, it, it, it poses a lot of the a lot of the inconsistencies, a lot of the prejudices that we take for granted. So new retellings, new translations, they are always welcome because they poke at the fallacies of the, and hypocrisies of society. And this is the very job of the artist. I, again, I use the artist in its broadest sense. That includes translators, it includes writers, it includes academics, it includes everybody else that want, that that engages with the world in creative ways. It's the very job. James Baldwin said it much more better than I will now retell his saying, his statement. But he says that the very job of the artist is to poke at the conscience of the world. It is to poke at the conscience of its readers. It is to provoke. Otherwise, we will remain in this really sort of this state lulled we're lulled by the world we we live in to stay inactive to stay uncritical to not ruffle feathers especially of the powers that be it's, the, it's our very purpose is as translators or academics or writers to expose the inconsistencies because the inconsistencies mm. which society upholds are violent so they need to be uh, exposed mm. we can't let them go by and now I have forgotten the second question that you asked me. Oh, yes, you asked me about gender and how people react and how I respond to that. Yeah, to be honest, uh, Samia, my overwhelming experience is one of people want to know. I think most hmm. folk, the co- subconscious level at the very least, if not consciously, I think most people are now thinking about these things consciously, recognize that when you have a religion like ours, when you have a religion like Islam, which is so radically fair and just and merciful, that the delivery through Islam then of anything that feels unjust, unfair, oppressive, requires some reconsidering. It requires some probing. Mm. It deserves some critical engagement. So for me, for the most part, people come with curiosity and open minds, even if and when they are not actually ready to internalize everything or accept everything. Or I, I, I was having a conversation the other day, I did a guest seminar for some undergrad and postgrad students at the University of Edinburgh. And one of the things that I said to them was, all of you are students, you're all actively engaged in learning right now. And you know how hard learning is, how much struggle goes into learning. But harder than learning is unlearning. Unlearning mm. because you have to you have to be humble in order to be able to learn. We know that's a, a wisdom that is quite common, I think. But to go from learning to unlearning is another stage of humility, which I don't think is unlocked to everybody because it's just so difficult to achieve. And so I appreciate that. And that's one of the reasons why I set up the Islam and Gender Read-Alongs back in 2020, because I recognised that I wasn't the only one that had these questions. I wasn't the only one who wanted to, who wanted to explore these ideas. Uh, and so I created this space. And I think that sometimes there are misconceptions that if you read a book or you make space to read a book, you must therefore agree with everything in that book and everything that author <laughs> says and does. And that's just simply not true. And so what I've really enjoyed over the years of having this space is that it's an opportunity for readers from around the world. And I do have readers from around the world to engage men, women and non-binary folk, Muslims and non-Muslims, primarily Muslims, though. And I think actually in our last few read-alongs, it's only been Muslim, where we get to engage with these ideas and where we get to say, I agree with this and I disagree with that. I can appreciate this, but I don't think that this is a, a, a strongly enough argued position. And I think that we don't have enough spaces like that where actually we can discuss something and not be at loggerheads dislike Mm. someone because we've taken a differing position to them and I think that really that's where if I, I really do feel that we need more spaces like that 
because if we can hold spaces like that for one another and if we can still love one another even as we differ on things that will go a very long way for the ummah at large we don't hold enough space for difference within us uh, amongst ourselves that doesn't then also generate hatred and toxicity we could if we could mm. move to a space where we allow one another the grace of asking questions allow one another the grace of vocalizing our curiosities our concerns our disagreements then we would all do better for that it's about we would generate more compassion amongst ourselves as well so for me i've not really been interested in being a propagandist of sorts for any one way of thinking or reading the religion i i think that islam is so vast and i think that the more you read and study it and and the more appreciation that you have for this phenomenal intellectual heritage that we have that actually you find yourself expanding and being able to make space for more muslims in in their varied ideas thoughts expressions and we just need more of that not less of it and i have to say that i am afraid of what the internet is doing there was a time when i was really excited i felt like yeah the internet is going to democratize religious knowledge because more of us are able to have a platform and more of us are able to speak up and more of us are able to engage but i feel that in the last few years actually this space as well especially the social media space has become very binary and i can talk about that for ages but i don't want to bore you nor your listeners but binary thinking and again something i used to say to my students when i was teaching at university that wherever there is binary thinking being asserted just know that is the lowest level of thought <laughs> that is not profound thinking it is not creative thinking it's not complex thinking it is the lowest rung of just turning somebody's brain partially on it is not mm. it is not the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is not the way of allah where allah is constantly telling us in the quran will you not think will you not ponder will you not look around have you looked at the birds have you looked at the boats on the sea have where allah is constantly trying to get us to think and think again and think harder and think longer and think in more complex ways but you then have human beings who come in and trying to shut down thinking it's really sad Yeah, it is and it's really it's really dangerous because I I remember and I guess this still applies to me today like I have always had so many questions but I think when you are presented with religion in very binary ways there's no space in that presentation for exploration there's no space for people to for for things to be looked at in a different way and then what then happens is that you then have to keep your questions to yourself and it just you move distantly more distant away from faith because you don't have space to have your questions answered and there are always answers there's if the spaces are there sometimes it's really important to have these questions whether they are based on being unsure about something or having doubt about something or wanting to know something there is so much to know about faith and islam and the world there isn't a single person that knows everything and also like we are not people the muslim community the muslim ummah like we are not a monolith like we are not one person or one type of person and although there may be things that are common among a lot of people but there is no two people are the same and i think we there's a real fear in if we don't even accept that ourselves then when we think about like muslim representation say in the media we can't then blame people for trying to portray mm. us in one way if we are not creating space for diversity and celebrating it and understanding it and being more open and being more accepting and warm and inviting to one another we can't then blame hollywood for wanting to portray all muslims in one horrible way that serves their agenda because we are not even doing it ourselves and so i think there's something really like i really love the fact that 
you are trying to facilitate a space, but you are only one person, right? And I do hope, I hope that there's more spaces for these kinds of conversations and for people to also to not feel judged. Because I think that is a big thing, is that even if we accept that we are different, but we also have to embrace the difference and we have to remove the judgment away from it. Yeah, we had a really Um, interesting incident um, a few weeks ago in the Islam and Gender Read-Along where we were reading Asma Barlas's Believing Women in Islam and she talks about the gendering of of God and how we think and how we conceptualise Allah because we do so singularly refer to Allah as he and people anyway so she's making the argument that Allah is not he a lot from Allah's self-disclosure we know that Allah is neither male nor female Allah is beyond gender Hmm. and so there was a whole discussion around that and one of the participants who was new it was their first time joining us said "I, I really don't like this conversation if Allah has referred to themselves as huwa in the Quran which is he in in Arabic, then who are we Mm. to decide that actually we're going to go for she, that we're going to refer to Allah as she sometimes, or that we're going to refer to Allah as they. And and I said, that's fine. (laughs) That's absolutely fine. If that's the, if that's how you feel comfortable, that's fine. But also allow yourself to think about what is it about the female that is, that is, that is what I'm looking for here. What is it about the female that is so repulsive to you that you are not willing to associate that with Allah, even just hypothetically thinking through gender and, and God, even though we know that mm. Allah is, is above gendering. When you had scholars like Ibn Arabi in the past who said sometimes you should use the pronoun she when referring to Allah just because we don't want to start thinking about Allah as a man. So it wasn't because of any sort of 21st century thinking or on gender that he said that. It was just simply because he recognized to exclusively refer to Allah as male, as hua, holds because we recognize the power of language, the possibility that then our minds will conceptualize Allah as a man. And so to counter that, he said, sometimes just refer to Allah as she. But we have this gender contamination now, don't we? Where if something is female, it's less, it's not as good. Mm. Uh, it's not as authoritative. It's not as just. It's not as powerful as if it was male. So that was all that I suggested to them then is just to think that is there some sort of gender contamination that happens when you associate the female with Allah? And we know that the names of Allah are both Jamali and Jalali names of Allah, those that are more, that that have masculine features to them and feminine features to them. Again, Ibn Arabi, this is something that he worked on a lot and it's something that we've discussed in the group too. Rahma, that's considered from the more Jamali qualities of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the compassion of Allah, the kindness of Allah, the gentleness of Allah. These are all considered Jamali attributes of Allah. And then we have the Jalali. Allah is the one who, who will judge. Allah is the one who avenges. Allah is the one who who withholds, these are all from Allah's Jalali attributes and those are associated uh, as being the more masculine traits of Allah. When And masculine and feminine shouldn't be misassociated then with male and female. It's, it, there's a distinction mm-hmm. between that. So when we have, again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, we, we have this really rich tradition centuries old that has already engaged these issues and I think the fact that Muslims can make this into such a flashpoint of sort of scandal uh, when we talk about these things is just again an exposure of how bereft we are of the of knowledge of our intellectual tradition. These aren't conversations that have been born out 21st discourse, 21st century discourse of the West, this is, these are conversations that were already taking place amongst our scholars of the past. So I think it's a reclamation. I think yeah. that these kind of spaces are a reclamation of our intellectual heritage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
I like, yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> Reclamation of our intellectual heritage. And yeah, I just, I think it is fine to be comfortable with a certain idea or a certain translation uh, and for you to feel like this is right and this is what I'm comfortable with. But again, it's just about that. There will be people that will prefer something else and find more alignment with something else. And I, and this is the thing that I believe that Islam is, is a religion that creates space for all of those things and that the truth is more than just one thing. It's not one answer ever. But again, I guess we are so limited in our intellect and it, we should consist, consistently be challenging ourselves to think beyond and think more. We're just going to take a small break here to talk about the sponsors of today's show, Muslim Charity. Since 1999, driven by Islamic faith and values, Muslim Charity have been delivering life-changing projects for communities living in poverty. They work with honesty, integrity and determination, supporting some of the world's most impoverished and under-recognised and vulnerable communities. As well as providing quality aid and support during emergencies and disasters, they focus on long-term development of families and communities looking to bring an end to hunger, thirst and poverty. They work with groups of people often marginalised and forgotten about, including the homeless community in the UK, children born in brothels, street children and adults with disabilities, the elderly and orphans. To find out more about their work, visit muslimcharity.org.uk forward slash Samia, that's S-A-M-I-A, and see some of my favourite projects especially as you consider why to give your precious charity today and on thinking actually you spent three years did you spend yeah. three years writing thesis which is now your second book what was that journey really like because you spent three years working in part on a translation but you've spent three years getting to know Aisha Radiella and her better than you knew her before what was it like and I guess what were some of the things that you've really taken away mm. from that time yeah so the three years was a, a translation but it was also a critical study so yeah no way you're going to get a PhD for just doing a translation for three years <laughs> so in a single word it was it would be roller coaster yeah and for those who've done yeah. a PhD or are doing one that's probably not a surprise and perhaps even a cliched response I have had some of my highest mm. highs and some of my lowest lows during that that three-year period but honestly the overwhelming feeling is just one of great privilege for me it was also one of those moments where I was able to look back and see how long Allah had been setting me up to arrive at that point. I had actually longed to study Islam more formally since I was an undergrad so the moment I graduated I just bolted towards this and I married a man who was already committed to Islamic learning and was himself a student at Jamia Fath in Syria. There's the hadith that none of you truly believes until they want for their brother what they want for themselves. And I think most people apply this to everyone except their own spouses, but not my husband. Alhamdulillah, he wanted for me in terms of Islamic education what he wanted for himself always too. He went all the way through to getting a PhD and then he very much made sure that I went all the way through to getting a PhD as well. <laughs> when we first got married and I joined him out in Syria, we'd often go to bookshops and I would just mainly just stand in awe of uh, all these books that surrounded me but that were at that time too advanced for me to access yet independently. But on one such trip to one of these bookshops, my husband had spotted a book which, you know, just caused him more excitement than any others had. And he pulled it down from the bookshelf and he put it in my hands saying, you're going to translate this into English one day. And that book was titled Al-Ijaba Lima Astadraktahu Aisha Ala Sahaba. Aisha's corrective, her rectifications of the companions, which was written by the 14th century scholar Imam Badruddin Zerkishi. And it was this book then, 15 years later, which became the central focus of my PhD. It was the three years that I did the PhD within, but Allah was preparing me for this path many years earlier. And so in this text, Imam al-Zarkishi, he's 
recorded over 200 statements of Aisha, in which, as I said earlier, she is correcting, refuting, and at times corroborating statements of almost invariably male companions. And these statements are chapterized according to who she is refuting or reinforcing in the structure of the book, as well as its content, Aisha's authority amongst her peers. And Imam Azarkashi, he prefaces the 220 statements with an enumeration of 42 qualities that were unique to Aisha. And so in doing so, he was combining her unique virtues with her unique contributions to the Islamic tradition. And this was done at a time when Aisha's memory, the memory of Aisha, how she was remembered, was being reduced to a really sanitized, pedestalized, ideal Muslim woman whose virtues were in her virginity at time of marriage and in her being presented in this dream draped in, or silk rather, to the Prophet ﷺ to, to indicate marriage to her, who was being reduced to this sort of be committed, loving role as a wife, all of which are important things. It's not to put any of those down. By doing a Zokashi, what he essentially sought to do was to attach to these virtues, which aren't to be diminished, her scholarly and intellectual virtues, thereby elevating her status once more as a religious authority in her own right. Yeah, it was long and challenging uh, to do the PhD. It was also, without a doubt, one of the most fulfilling and blessed things that I've ever done. And I feel deeply privileged to have done it. And so now my only dua for it is that as it makes its way into the world, published as Gendering the Hadith, recentering the authority of Aisha, Mother of the Believers, that it brings comfort and benefit to those who read it and that it's accepted as a service to the Ummah by Allah. What's interesting, actually, Samia, is that since since I had the since I got my PhD and since pu- and getting it published, it's been a few years. Yeah, it was interesting to go back to the thesis because obviously it had to be slightly remodeled and rejigged in order to make it read less as a thesis and more like a book. But there were certain ideas that I went back to, and I you know I had the freedom <laughs> to do what I want with them. So. Yeah, I know the thesis is available to read online, but the book is actually has some distinct changes to it. As well. You so it has been a few years. When you and in between, you also wrote a treasury of Aisha, which was published by Q Publishing. When you approached that book, how did you find? Because that is that does not read like a thesis at all. Um, it's very accessible. It's really really great, and I've. I've been reading your new book as well, which also doesn't doesn't really read like a thesis either. What do you've explained? You have edited it. The Treasury of Aisha is very different. How was that transition? Because you went from like academic doctor to now writing something that is a lot more accessible, um, but still also on a very similar on the same. Yeah, so for me, Samia, it's always been important that what I write is accessible. So even when I wrote my thesis, you're writing for a very different audience when you're writing your thesis. Yeah, you're you're writing yeah. for your academic peers. You're writing for your academic seniors. You're writing for a community of scholars. You have to get their approval essentially through an examination through your viva. Uh, you have to prove mm. that you've. Uh, offered something new, you've made a contribution, an, an actual, authentic, legitimate new contribution to knowledge, production, and you have to hold your own as a scholar. So it's a very different process. But at the same time, I've always wanted to ensure that whatever I produce serves the Muslim community firstly and foremostly. So even as I wrote my thesis, mm. I always wrote it very much with that in mind. So it has all the rigor mm. of academia, and, and but it is also when whenever somebody from within the community decides to read it, it's hopefully understandable. It, of course, it will challenge them. Mm. There's a lot of theory in there. There's it, it is of a academic standard. It's of a scholarly standard. People will have to exert themselves to to understand it there may be aspects of it they can't understand if they don't have a particular training themselves um, and that's fine that's mm. just the nature of scholarly work and on the but on the other hand when writing 
a treasury of Aisha, I still brought that scholarly rigor to it. So everything that I write, I cite as well. I'm very, and I think that's not just my academic training. I think that's also recognizing that as a woman writing about religion, I will be scrutinized much more. And so I need to cover my back mm. that much more. But I loved the, I loved, I love both. I love writing for a scholarly, uh, you know, audience, but I also love writing for a, for the broader Muslim community. Uh, and I think that, so when I was writing my thesis, I was very much focused on al Ijaba, that particular text, remaining within that, the, the hadith that were presented in there. I go outside of those every so now and then. But primarily, I'm only engaging with those hadith in that particular text. In A Treasury of Aisha, on the other hand, I had free reign. And that's exactly what I did. Because when I was doing my mm. thesis, I was still coming across other hadith of Aisha's, which fit within that same genre or, or within the same theme of the text that I was looking at, but wasn't collected by Imam al So these were statements of Aisha where she was also correcting, refuting, corroborating. Um, but they that Imam Zarkashi hadn't recorded. And so I'd been, com- I'd, I'd been compiling all of these statements and made a file with all of them whilst I was doing my thesis, not really knowing what I'd ever do with them, but thinking in the future this would come in handy. Uh, and then, of course, I was asked by Cube to contribute to the Treasury se- series and, and write a Treasury of Aisha. So I had that bank of statements that I'd already been building. And then I just allowed myself the pure joy of going into history books, tafsir books, hadith books, and finding other such statements of Aisha's to put towards the treasury of Aisha. And I could write that as a believer speaking to believers rather than as an academic writing for other academics. And so it's a different mode. And I love both modes, actually. Uh, But Mm. I like to keep everything that I write as accessible as I can, whilst also Mm. recognizing that academic texts may sometimes have some limits to how accessible they are because they may demand from the reader a little bit more in terms of what they Mm. already know. Yeah. Um, One of the... So obviously you, in all of your work, enable us to to look at Aisha Radiala and her just so differently, to look at her closely, to look at... to understand who she was and who she is and what she has contributed to Islam and the history of Islam and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and all of these things and I mean you've really helped I think for me to bring her to life as a person with characteristics and character and personality and sass and like wisdom and wit and strength one of the things that one of the more negative things that come up time and time again in our community about Aisha Radila and her was the age at which she married the Prophet Sallallahu And you do you write about this in 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 the your gendering of the Hadith tradition book and your PhD thesis. And you say you say from the outset, I'm not here to to write to give you a conclusion about what what age she actually was. But I just wondered if you could just to the fact that we sometimes preoccupy ourselves with this issue and we let it taint and we let it be used in a really harmful way. But like why we should be thinking about it slightly differently. Yeah, what a great Uh question, Samia. So for me, and like you said, in the gendering the Hadith tradition, I do begin to look at that, but only to the extent that I am interested in how the history of Aisha, the historicity of Aisha has changed over the decades since she was alive and what's so fascinating is that her age at marriage doesn't become an issue for a long time so initially the question is and again remember I talk about historicity and situationality when we're thinking about translation it's the same with what are the issues that we concern ourselves with right what are the demands that we make of our history and our and our text find is that when the Muslim community started to split and we have we have the rupture that creates Sunni Muslim Muslims and Shia Muslims have a very different view of Aisha they view her with a great deal of suspicion even dislike whereas the Sunni tradition shows her a lot of veneration and love and respect and so in the polemic between Shias and Sunnis 
Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallam, and Aisha radiallahu anha get pitted against each other. Also Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet sallam, get pitted against one another. So where Khadija and Fatima are mm. venerated in the Shia tradition, they are not, Aisha is not venerated in the Shia tradition. And so in this polemic between Shia and Sunni scholars, where you have the Shia scholars talk, extolling uh, Khadija and Fatima, and one of the things that Fatima is really extolled for is her virginity, <laughs> you get statements like she gave birth, but she never had a period and she never had postpartum bleeding because she was so pure. And you just think, oh, this is just so obviously from the wild imagination of a man who has really phobic attitude towards the, <laughs> the sublime, incredible, miraculous, life-giving efficacy of the female body. Of course she had periods and of course she, she had postpartum bleeding. How are we to believe otherwise? And then on the other hand, there was Aisha about whom you know, in her very lifetime, there was aspersion cast over her fidelity to the Prophet Sallallahu through the slander that took place. Mm -hmm. And then after that, there was this, again, casting of aspersion on her virginity when she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu because there are, there, there, it is noted in, in, hist in some history books that she was betrothed to somebody else before she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu and that when the Prophet Sallallahu had a dream about about Aisha and he presented this to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that Abu Bakr then had to go to the family that she was already betrothed to and have that broken before she could marry to the Prophet. So in that there was this sort of there was this attempt at saying that she wasn't a virgin when she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu So in response to that we see our Sunni scholars reduce her age down to some ridiculous age so that then the virginity of Aisha just cannot be questioned because she's just so young at the point at which she gets married mm. that it becomes impossible. So initially the issue was can we bring her age down as much as possible so as to prove that she was a virgin because the, the, it was her virginity that we needed to save. And then later on, even as Orientalist voyeurs come in and start to engage with Muslims, when missionaries, Christian missionaries come in and start to engage with Muslims, even they justify this. They're like, oh yeah, in, in, in those exotic lands where the temperature is, is higher, women ripen. This is literally a word that's used uh, by these Orientalists. The women there ripen quicker. And so the girls are actually like women. And, and of course, there's this whole disgusting sort of engagement of colonialists in Muslim lands with young girls that gets completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. So even they try to, they actually use this idea, this notion of Aisha's young age at, at the marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu as a legit of their own essentially paedophilic behaviours, their own paedophilic behaviours as colonialists mm -hmm. in Muslim lands. It's only later on then, when uh, much later on, that this then becomes problematized as, oh, actually she was a child. Now we have mm -hmm. a different idea. Now, so again, it comes down to the different demands that are made on the tradition in accordance to what are the polemics that Muslims are engaged in, right? And so now mm -hmm. we're going, now we need to reverse the age of Aisha. We need to make her older, right? Yeah. And this is what I show in my <laughs> thesis that it's actually very much more likely that she was much older when she got married because if we just take all the different connecting dots in terms of how old she was when Abu Bakr converts, how old she is when the Hijra happens, when the Prophet Sallallahu migrates to Medina, when we look at her statements whereby she talks, she mentions witnessing certain verses being revealed, and you know that those verses were revealed at particular moments and times in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu And in order for her to recognize this, she must have been that much older. So when you triangulate all of that, yeah, one does come to the conclusion that she probably was older. But the reason why I refuse to engage this conversation too much, and I, I read one review of Treasury of Aisha where the person essentially was like, how can you talk about Aisha and not talk about her age? Why do you constantly allow yourself to be distracted by a question that has been created by people who are not even necessarily sincere to Aisha 
and her life? Why are you constantly distracted by those questions instead of allowing yourself to get to know this phenomenal woman who achieved so much in her life and has so much to teach us? Why are you distracted by this ridiculous Mm. question, which will continue to come? For now, we are trying to make her older. In another hundred years, we might be trying to make her younger again. For me, genuinely, I don't care. And I think that Muslims should also Mm. not care. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think the, the reason why I asked was because... I get frustrated with the obsession with this because I think it's so harmful because it's not actually coming from people that care. It's coming from people that demonize Islam and demonize Prophet Muhammad as being somebody that was perverted. Mm -hmm. That's like, right? That's what it is. And if, I mean, we don't normally talk in black and white, but that's how black and white it is. Like it is coming with ill intention. And that's why I get very frustrated with it because it doesn't matter if I'm reading your book and just generally as well like I thought she probably wasn't as young as what is being claimed but if she was even if she was is it not better for us just to leave it we can't change it any we can't change the past we can change what we say about it but it is the thing that is it, it can do so much harm because there's so much good that can, that is going to be undone by this one thing that isn't even confirmed anyway and I think regardless like there's no solid answer from my understanding anyway so yeah I just yeah I find it very frustrating and I think the way you ended it was definitely right that we just we need to let ourselves to not care about it and to not get distracted by it because I think it can open itself up to real harm all of us and I think the only people the only exception I make to that is actually when I have Muslims genuinely hurt when they realize that this is 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 circulated when I have Muslims genuinely hurt who come to discuss this then I will sit with that and I will give them the evidence and get talk through how she probably was older that it's very unlikely it's historically very unlikely she was six it's much more likely she was around 17 when she got married to the prophet and I would just direct people to my book to to read that and get a more insight into that. Samia, would you just give me a moment? You're going to have to edit this out, but I need to get the charger for my Mac. I'm going to die. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm so sure. sorry. That's fine. That's fine. It all like, fully charged before I got on, so I didn't think to plug it in. And we we were nattering for about 45 minutes. So. I know. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry about that, yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, and I think, obviously, I think there are probably people that do struggle with it and so I yeah I I think that I found that that part of your book that part of that chapter of your book really interesting actually because there were things that I didn't that I didn't know like I just I learned so much from it and you don't conclude you don't give a a a full conclusion as to what age exactly you think that she was but it's really helpful to understand what possibly happened with the ways in which that is being presented and being recorded over time. I want to talk about what's happening in the world right now in in Palestine in Gaza but also in Sudan and in Syria in Yemen in so many places in the Congo are witnessing I think possibly one of the worst things that we've ever lived through we've ever seen and it's really difficult for a lot of people just looking at what's happening there's I think there's a lot of collective grief um and also a lot of like disbelief at just the horrific things that that are taking place can we learn from Aisha and even like from our faith what can we learn when it comes to and hope and and struggle and also community and and activism I was talking with my kids the other day about living life with a prophetic lens, trying to see the world mm. through the gaze of the best of the believers, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who we know once marveled at the state of the believer, saying, how great is the affair of the believer? If something good happens to him or her, then they are grateful and this is good for them. And if something bad happens, then they are patient and this is also good for them. 
then the Prophet ﷺ said this is only for the believer, that this, this state is only for the believer, that all circumstances are essentially good. And we see this mode of being in Aisha who was tested in many ways. And each time she showed full and utter reliance on Allah. And in both of my books, I expound on the story of the slander of Aisha, which was a tumultuous and difficult time, not only for Aisha and the Prophet ﷺ, but all of the Muslims, for all of the Muslims of Medina, because you had these enemies of Islam rejoicing in spreading this terrible, slanderous lie casting doubt on the honor of Aisha and her fidelity. And I just want you to think, imagine being Aisha at that time. I think we've, all of us have had some experience of betrayal, some experience in which someone has lied about us or misrepresented us. Now recall the feeling you had when that happened and multiply it by a thousand times. And perhaps then we will start to get close to what this incident did to Aisha at the time. And yet, many years later, many years later, when she's sitting with Zainab bint Jahsh, a co-wife, and the two of them are in like this playful exchange with each other about what made each of them special in the sight of Allah and the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah, Aisha, sorry, mentions that she was declared innocent by Allah in the Quran as a response to the lies that were being spread about her. This is what made her special. And when she says this now, Zainab remembers this incident as well, because sadly it was one of the people that was very engaged in spreading this lie about Aisha was Zainab's own sister. And because of that, Zainab had been called in by the Prophet ﷺ to inform him what she, what she knew of Aisha's character. And Zainab at the time had said she only knew good of Aisha uh, and her character. So Zainab now, she's sitting with Aisha and she asks her, she says to her, what did you do? What did you say to get through that difficult time? And Aisha replies, I said, Hasbi Allah, Allah is sufficient for me and what an excellent disposer of affairs is he. And this is, of course, the supplication that we now hear so many of our brothers and sisters in Gaza repeating often. And I can only think it is because they have a depth of faith in Allah and the Rasul that the rest of us are still just catching up to. I don't know if we ever will. And it's so easy to roll hadith and ayat off of our tongues. These are not contingent. These verses and these hadith that we are saying, they're not contingent on the parameters of our own making, the limitations of our own faith or the limitations of our own lived experiences. They are an orienting. These verses that we have, these hadith that we have, they are an orienting that we are supposed to use to strive to internalize so deeply that they stand in all situations. So if we say all the affairs of the believers are wondrous, they are something to marvel at, then that is what they are in all affairs. All all circumstances are ones in which we can still marvel. And if we say that Allah is sufficient for us and that Allah is the best disposer of our affairs, then this is also in all circumstances. And if there is a moment in which we can't Mm. believe in these things or we can't extend these statements to, then that that is a shortcoming in our reliance and trust in Allah. It's some deficit in our knowledge or acknowledgement of Allah. Even this, even this is an opportunity for us to expand. It's an opportunity for us to expand on our iman and expand on our understanding of the world and in our perspective. Sometimes it's a case of just altering our perspective a little bit. And there's this, there's a Ukrainian Jewish poet called Ilya Kaminsky. And I read a poem of his recently where he said, at the trial of God, we will ask, why did you allow this? And the answer will be an echo why did you allow? And I feel like that's a reminder that when we look at all that's happening in the world and wonder why is God letting this happen, perhaps the question we should instead be asking, what will I reply to Allah when I am asked what I did to stop this? And this is a really 
powerful mm. reorienting, I think, because it moves us from being passive bystanders to active agents pushing for change. Uh, and one can only really be successful at that if we maintain optimism, which is precisely what is being inculcated mm. when the Prophet wasallam tells us how wonderful all of our affairs are. And Aisha illustrates the power of saying and meaning it when we say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, that we rely on Allah and know Allah to be the best of our dispose, uh, best disposer of our affairs. When, when the Battle of Uhud took place, we, I think all, all Muslims know it was a devastating defeat for Muslims, especially because it followed on from Badr, which was the opposite. It had been a glorious, remarkable win. But at the Battle of Uhud, you had around 70 Sahaba, you had 70 companions that died that day, that were shaheed. And this was a great blow to the morale of the Muslims. They saw with their own eyes their slain brethren, their, and their bodies were returned home for burial. And there was so much sorrow and mourning that engulfed the Muslim community, much in the same way that we find ourselves also engulfed in mourning and sorrow. And we are also witnessing our slain brothers and sisters in, in Gaza. But in the Mishkat al-Masabih, I was reading it the other day, it's recorded that the Prophet wasallam said, when your brothers were smitten at the Battle of Uhud, when they were slain at the Battle of Uhud, Allah put their spirits in the hearts of green birds who go down to the rivers of paradise eat its fruits and they nestle in lamps of gold which hang in the shade of the throne of Allah. Then when they experience the sweetness of their food, their drink and rest, these shuhada, these martyrs, they asked Allah that who would tell their brothers and sisters who remained in the dunya about the delight that they were experiencing, that they were alive in Jannah so that their brethren who they left behind in dunya will not stop desiring Jannah and nor would they recoil in war. And Allah said, I will relay this to them. And it was at this behest of the shuhada of Uhud that Allah then revealed the verses of Ali Imran, um, verses 169 to 171, which so many of us know so well, where Allah says, well, don't think of those who are martyred in the cause of Allah as dead. In fact, they are alive, they are well, and they are with their Lord, they are with Allah, and they are well provided for. فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمْ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ أَنْ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they are rejoicing in Allah's bounties. And they are being delighted. They are delighted for those who are yet to join them. That they're waiting for them. That there will be no fear mm. for them and nor will they grieve. No fear for them and nor will they grieve. They are joyful for receiving Allah's grace and bounty and that Allah doesn't deny the rewards of the believers. These are verses really to sit with and the hadith, the sabab and nazul there, the, the sabab and nazul there, the cause of that revelation, that those 70 who were slain and whose, who, the circumstances in which they were slain were so devastating and the witnessing of their bodies was so devastating and the burial of their bodies was so devastating and the taunting that happened by the enemies at the time was so devastating. This was a real blow that at that time, it was the, the, the very spirits of those who were slain that went to Allah, who, who find themselves in the hearts of green birds, flitting around the highest Jannah under the throne of Allah, in, in shades, under the shade of Allah's throne. Just this sublime vision that really the mind can't truly encapsulate and that in that moment then they say to Allah can you let our brothers and sisters back who are still stuck in that limited small dunya that is going to last for what but part of a day let them know what we have so that they don't become fearful and dejected and demotivated by what they saw by the limits of what their vision could see 
So how wondrous the conditions of the believers then. If good befalls them, they are grateful and that is good for them. And if bad befalls them, they are patient and that is good for them. And let's remember that being patient isn't enduring in silence. It's being patient through the trial in remaining reliant on Allah, whilst also being strong and courageous enough to be an agent of change, no matter what. Because our responsibility is only to act. The results are upon Allah. But the combination of acting and trusting in Allah, that is the most powerful combination in history because that is indefatigable yeah. and undefeatable. It is a combination mm. that will always lead to success. Yeah, that is so inspiring and so powerful. And I think the perfect way to end this conversation, which has been so wonderful. And I think, I know I definitely needed to hear that beautiful reminder from you at the end just now because I think you're right like we are always we are taught to to tie up our camel and have faith in Allah it's not just just leave your camel to roam and and trust in Allah that it's not going to get stolen or run away and this is this is something that we've been the, the tie your camel thing I think is something that we are all told from a very young age. It's a very, it's a very teachable moment, a very teachable example, but one that we sometimes forget. It's about understanding that there's always two things. It's about trusting in Allah and knowing that fundamentally everything is in Allah's hand, but also knowing that you have to do something. Allah tells us that if, even if we're holding a seed in our hand and it's the final hour to plant the seed, it's the act of planting the seed, even if we know that the final hour is upon us and this is never going to grow into a tree so yeah thank you and thank you so much for your time today would you like to tell our listeners what is happening with the publication of your oh, thank new you book? samia thank you for having me you always ask such great probing questions i really enjoy being in conversation with you so my book the latest book gendering the hadith tradition is actually out already it was published in february february 10th I want to say I was abroad when it happened <laughs> so yeah it's, sorry February 20th so it is actually out in the world now I appreciate because it is an academic text it, it is pricey I have no benefit in the price of that sadly but I do recommend that order it in through your libraries is what I keep saying to people because it is an academic text so it has a it has an academic price tagged attached to it but yeah, it's available everywhere. So wherever you regularly get your books from, that's where you can find it. And if you're willing to and able to fork out for it, that that's my pleasure and honor. And I pray that it's benef beneficial and worth every penny for those who, who, who make the effort to, to purchase it. But otherwise, yeah, order it in through your libraries. That's the advice that I'm giving to folk. That's great. Thank you. Thank you pleasure. so much, Thank Sophia. You. Today's episode was brought to you by Muslim Charity, a faith-based international charity working around the world to tackle poverty, hunger and thirst. They deliver your zakat and sadaqa with honesty and transparency, reaching those in need with impactful projects all year round. Muslim Charity provide vulnerable communities with life-saving healthcare, clean water, food, livelihood opportunities and education, helping everyone to thrive. If you're looking for a charity you can trust, especially when it comes to your zakat and sadaqa, Muslim Charity is the one for you. Visit muslimcharity.org.uk forward slash Samia, S-A-M-I-A, to check out some of my favourite impactful projects. That's muslimcharity.org.uk forward slash Samia.